Oi, this is Nigel McGuinness, Ring of Honor Superstar, and you are listening to another wrestling podcast. Stay tuned, you wanker. It's time for uh, another wrestling podcast. Podcast. This is episode 32. Happy New Year still. It's the second week of the new year. We're into January, Jonathan. Jonathan, are you out there? I'm here and I'm I'm ready to go. I'm uh I can't believe it, like you said, second week into the new year, and we've got so much amazing stuff on the horizon for all of you. Uh, you wouldn't believe it if we told you. That's right. And uh guys, that's Jonathan Benjamin. I'm Steve Credo. We're the hosts of another wrestling podcast, AWP for short. Let's Triple H it up, Jonathan, if you will. It's the new year. We can we can say AWP now, can't we? Yeah, that's what all the cool kids are saying. I know. You gotta you, you lose your name after a while, then you're just three initials. So hey, we're AWP. You're listening to us right now. Uh Jonathan, wow. What what, what what's going on today? Well, uh we've got a lot of stuff planned today. Uh, but right before we get into that, I would like to tell everybody it's a new year, so you haven't really heard this yet, but Definitely check us out on our new and improved website. That is anotherwrestlingpodcast.com. That's where you can find out all about the upcoming shows, any shows that we may be going to, um, also any of our upcoming guests, and uh, pretty much it's our hub, like Steve has said in the past. So check out anotherwrestlingpodcast.com for all your AWP needs. See what I did there? That's that's right. Uh, that's he, he said it. That's our mothership. That's where you'll find everything. Another wrestling podcast dot com. Uh, but guys, if you're listening to us, we really need the support. So make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes. Subscribe to us on Stitcher. You can follow us on Podbean. Follow us on Player FM. We're even on Geek Life Radio. We're all over the place, Jonathan. We're uh, we're invading the the internet pretty much, if you will, right? Yeah, um, my mom liked all of our photos on uh, Twitter and Instagram the other day, so we're we're moving on up. As you can see, guys, uh, be 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 there for us because there's only so much Jonathan's mom can do for us right now. Absolutely, so. that's right, guys. But Jonathan, we have a big year coming up. We're going to be invading the Man Show in Poughkeepsie, New York, at the Mid Hudson Civic Center. We're going to be releasing some info pretty soon about it. Some big news, so make sure you you stay tuned for that. Uh, so many things happening, Jonathan. So many things happening this year. That's just a tad, a tad bit of info that you're going to get right now. So, just the tip. Just the tip. Uh, if well, that's what she said. Yeah, yes. Uh, but guys, that's that's what we're doing. This is another wrestling podcast. We're going to talk about wrestling. We're not just talking about Raw or SmackDown or TNA or you know. We're, we're not just talking about the shows you see. We're talking about you know the things. You guys out there like to talk about topics, topical show. So you can listen to any one of our shows. Go back in the history of AWP. Listen to episode three. Listen to episode ten. Listen to episode fifteen, and and they'll still be as great as uh, the last show, right? Yeah. Now there's something I feel bad about, and I'm gonna remedy remedy it right now. 
Um, we put this podcast out for you every week. It's a quality show. We get some awesome guests. But I feel bad for those of you who maybe don't listen to us um, online or at work or whatever. So for all of you that are listening and you say, man, I wish that I could enjoy another wrestling podcast in another way. Uh, Steve, we have something for them, don't we? Another way? Yeah, another way to listen to another wrestling podcast. Say it ain't so, Jonathan. How could we do this? Well, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, I, I'm saying that right, YouTube channel. That's right. Um, it's 2015, so um, <laughs> it's uh, youtube.com slash another wrestling podcast. We will be introducing some new videos, um, new interviews, exclusives that you won't catch on here you won't catch anywhere else except for YouTube. That's right. And Jonathan, you're wrong because it's youtube.com slash another wrestling POD. There's only so many characters you can uh, fit in some of these links. Only so many characters that you could fit. So it's another wrestling pod. Another uh, wrestling pod. But search another wrestling podcast. You'll find it. And if you can't find it, go to our website. The link's up there. You got it. So yeah, Jonathan, that's right. We're going to have exclusive, exclusive interviews only that you can only that you can hear on our YouTube page. So be sure to stay tuned to that because we're gonna have coming up next week none other than Alex the Pug Porto. Do you remember him? I do. I absolutely remember him. Um, I was always wondering why he was wearing a wrestling singlet, like like something that you would find in high school. But um, he was a pretty good wrestler. Didn't really do a lot in WWE, but went on to do some other big things, and uh, I'm excited to talk to him. That's right. He was almost the Kurt Angle before Kurt Angle was, if you will. You know, he had that little amateur style character wrestling, so it'll be interesting to talk to him next week. And only, guys, only on YouTube.com slash Another Wrestling Pod, we're going to have a lot of exclusive interviews. A big shout out to, to Joseph Bruin with the New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, and Jonathan, are you ready for June? Because we're going to be going to the New England Fan Fest 5 out there in Rhode Island at the convention center out there. And that's where you're going to see a lot of these guys that we're going to be talking to on our YouTube exclusives. Um, but yeah, right? It'll it'll be here before you know it. And uh, it's definitely cold here in the Northeast. So I am absolutely ready for June. And I can't wait to be there. I was unfortunately not able to be there last year because, once again, some of us had to work. <laughs> and um, so I can't wait. This is going to be amazing. There's some big names coming. Uh, Goldberg is going to be there. Three-fifths of the Spirit Squad are going to be there. Good old JR. Good old JR. Mick Foley. Alberto Del Rio. And Ricardo Rodriguez, just to name a few. Yeah, that's right. There's going to be tons and tons of guys out there. It was a great, great time last year. That's kind of where we launched, Jonathan. That was like the birthplace of another wrestling podcast. And uh, to, to come full circle will be uh, will be really great. Yeah, we birthed really hard there that weekend. <laughs> that was where it all happened, folks. Come see it again. Well, live Sinta and everywhere, up to your elbows. <laughs> wow. Another wrestling censored podcast. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I have, uh, we're talking a little bit about history, our history, but I want to talk a little bit about what do they say? They tell you this in high school and every dating website and stuff that you uh, you get on. But if you don't learn from history, you are doomed to repeat it. That's right, Jonathan. Doomed to repeat it. History repeating itself. Yes. And uh, I think that – I don't know if everybody is on board with this right now, if you can see where we're going. But I think that there's a really good correlation with 90s – wrestling 90s wwf wrestling and a little bit of what we're getting into today we're kind of slipping backwards if you know what i mean i know what you mean so in the 1990s um everybody remembers it fondly you had hulk hogan you had macho man randy savage you had some really big names in the wwf but with those names you had some other names yes <laughs> I know where you're going, Jonathan, and uh, there was a there was a lot of a lot of bad 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 uh, bad times in the past of uh, these gimmicks. Uh, Doink the clown, yep, the goon, mm -hmm. uh, man mountain rock, repo yeah, well, he, man, you know. Well, just to be fair, man mountain rock was awesome. <laughs> repo man, the stalker. I mean, these were a lot of gimmicks that it was just like. 
am I at the circus or am I at a wrestling show? Don't get me wrong. Some of them were good. Some of them were bad. Some of them were, hey, we're, we're stuck now in the 90s. We don't know what else to do. And it, it was just becoming too cartoony. I, I don't know. It was like you're watching Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have a real direction for these guys. They It was pretty much if you were an occupation, you, you were hired. So T.L. Hopper was a plumber. Um, you know, we had, like I said, the goon was a hockey player, Duke man, the dumpster. rock Duke, the dumpster drossy. Um, it, it was, it was very confusing, but as a kid, you know, it sold action figures, it sold merchandise and, uh, but it left the more adult fans that, uh, 18 to 35 demographic wanting more. Yep. And, um, you know, fast forward a little bit, then in the late 90s, we got what's arguably looked at as the best time to be a professional wrestling fan ever, and, it, and that was the Attitude Era. That's right. They had they had to step it up a notch, Jonathan. They had to they had to change the tide, change change the, everything that they were doing because it was like they're losing fans. Uh, the fans were getting older. The fans didn't want to see this anymore. They wanted something edgier. You know, they wanted something more real. You know, uh, something that could, they could relate to more. And that's what the Attitude Era pretty much brought them. You know, you had Steve Austin, the swearing, the sex, the violence. Um, you know, it was appealing to, to the much more older male demographic. And, you know, it was, I don't know if you want to call it the, they call it the attitude era, but it was almost in the borderline reality era to where, you know, things were, you know, there were no more clowns, there were no more goons, you know. Um, maybe there, I can't think off the top of my head that there might have been a few of these characters left left in the, the, the shadows, but... uh you know, times changed, and they changed for the good, you know. That, that was, I don't know, that was pretty much the explosion of the pro wrestling, uh, what we know now in a way, but uh, not what we know now. I don't know what I'm getting into, but you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it was a, definitely a boom period, and you had um, real gritty, like, storylines. So I remember the Stone Cold Steve Austin, Brian Pillman angle where Steve Austin broke into Pillman's house and Pillman had a gun, yeah. and it was just like, what am I? What am I watching? <laughs> I know like, it was like cops. There was like reality TV in a way, and it was you didn't you know it was it was far from having Doink come out with uh, Dink Pink Link and Stink or Wink. I don't know what the rest of them were called, but you know what I mean. It was yeah. definitely it was definitely good. It was definitely capturing you know everybody's attention. Every it was just like the birth of Hulkamania. You know this was the birth of like all these other wrestling fans, and that you know Steve Austin was pretty much pulling that train of uh, the Attitude Era. Yeah, you had, I mean, I just remember, like, watching it and thinking, God, I can't believe they're getting away with this. I mean, there was times that you actually thought that someone was going to be naked. Uh, I mean, there was more than one time whenever Val Venus was about to get his uh, PP chopped off by Kai and Tai. Um, you know, there was real-life situations where they had, yeah, I said PP. Um, they they did the whole angle where Hawk was, like, drunk and he fell off the Titan Tron, and they were just some real real life issues and i don't know that you see that so much today uh you you know you've got a lot of they kind of pulled the curtain back a little bit as much as they want to say that it's it's more exposed than ever yeah kind of is where everybody knows that professional wrestling is scripted but what yeah yeah sorry spoiler (laughs) alert everybody who's listening um but i don't think that they really push the envelope like they did back uh, yeah, then. It's the competition, man. I mean, it's like, you know, WCW, they had competition, they were losing ratings, and they needed to do something to to, to win those back. So it was like, you know, survival of the fittest, if you will, you know. Uh, you know, you, you either adapt or die, and that's what they did. They were adapting to the times, and, you know, the times change, and they had that competition, but now... You know, people want to call TNA competition to WWE. It's not. They want to call Ring of Honor competition to WWE. It's not. Um, it's just they don't have that machine behind them like WWE has. And that's – it's it's kind of sad because that's what's happening. You know, like we said at the beginning, you know, it's history repeating itself. I think – I don't know who's running the ship backstage, but maybe I'm going to go out on a limb here and say Vince McMahon is still at the helm. And, you know, I think without that competition – you know, it's like, well, why do we need to do this anymore? Let's just go back to this idea of, uh, hmm, let's put a midget in a bull outfit and call these guys Los Matadores. You know what I'm saying? I, I can't. I think we've talked about them the most on our show out of the past year than anybody else because, from shittiest gimmicks to this and that, you know, it was like 
why why are they doing this to these guys? They're a great tag team. They don't need to be matadors with a little midget dressed as a bull. Like that is total nineties repeating itself, right? Yeah, I, I don't understand I'll never understand, I guess, why like NXT right now is like it or not, it's the the breeding ground for to tomorrow superstars. So um Somebody who's on WWE television right now who's got a funny gimmick is Adam Rose. So they're trying to make him like Russell Brand, and he's got all of his rosebuds, and they've got a bunny and all that stuff, which is very kid-oriented. It, you know, it was fun to begin with, but Adam Rose, prior to that, was in uh, NXT as Leo Kruger, and he was like a South African hunter. So I don't understand why they feel like that they have to throw that gimmick on you because it's a proven entity. Everybody who you talk to who's in wrestling says that the best characters are the characters of the people that are portraying them with the volume turned up to 11. So Steve Austin is really Steve Austin, but he got to go a little overboard whenever he was wrestling. The Rock, the same way. Um, you know, like Trish Stratus never had to come in in a, in a bunny suit to get over. You know what I mean? Like, so... Yeah, man. Even, even like, I mean, to name other few, like you have like Fandango. Like he's a great. That's, hey, wait, 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 wait. That's Fandango. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I mean, he's a great wrestler, but I mean, they they have something for dancing gimmicks. I don't know what it is, but it's like they can't change it. They just love dancing gimmicks, uh, and it's like. Uh, I get it, but I mean, he he's just so much more better than being this dancer, and I, I you know what I mean? Like, I, I get why they're doing it, but at the same time, it's like, you don't need it, you know? He's much more better than this, and it's like, it's his gimmick is almost killing his, what he can, you know, give you, or do for you, you know? Yeah, I, I guess that, you know, they've switched back to PG, uh, which is mainly because they know that they're making lots of money off of kids. That's why John Cena is still in the position that he's in. I mean, I'm not taking away anything from his work rate or anything like that. I'm just saying that they know that they're going to sell X amount of youth John Cena shirts because of he's like Superman in, in real life. But um, I think that what it's doing is creating this hole again for that 18 to 35 demographic. I'm not even going to say male anymore because there are a lot of women that watch wrestling these days. And NXT is becoming that kind of home for those people. Um, there are a lot of alternatives out there these days. So, you know, like I said, NXT is a big deal. Uh, there's certain places like Lucha Underground. We had John Hennigan on the show earlier this year, or last year, actually, I can say that, in 2014. And um, he talked to us about how it's it's almost like a film and and a television show because they're using different angles. They're using more of a gritty type of atmosphere. That's right. And, they got, uh, Robert Rodriguez is behind all that. You know, they got the above camera, uh, above the the ring camera. You know, adding the whole different aspect to what you see and stuff. Um, and yeah, it's good. I, they're starting to have some alternatives finally, and that's a good thing. And you know, I just hope uh, you know these guys actually catch up to the WWE because I I think it's that lack of competition. I'll go back to that to where you know they they feel like they don't need to do anything else except for the same old or just go back to the the original formula and just bring that back out. And the fans don't want that, you know. Like it's kind of sad when your developmental system is better than your actual pro, pro league, if you will. You know what I mean? Like your NXT NXT's pay per view. Uh, was better than your TLC pay-per-view. And granted, TLC pay-per-view for WWE wasn't, you know, they're one of their top four pay-per-views, but that's the main roster. That's your main show. How is your developmental system having a better pay-per-view than you are? Uh, it blows my mind. It blows my mind. No, it's abs- I absolutely get it. And I think that's, whether WWE realizes it or not or even cares, uh, there's a lot of alternatives out there. And especially in our area, we can go to so many different you know places and watch so many different things. And um, we've got a lot of great wrestling in the area. And you know, FWE, Northeast Wrestling, lots of different independents are out there. Those are two that you know we, we have the privilege to work with. But they're really putting it all on the line and you're getting dream matches and you're getting less restriction because there isn't somebody that's saying, listen, I don't know if that's going to work for these fans or, or, you know, X amount of people watching. So 
I think the the wrestling future is bright. I don't necessarily know that um, huge company wrestling is the way of the future. You know, you get on, this is kind of off subject, but really not. Like, you, in the beginning, like with WWE, if you wanted to buy a wrestling shirt, you really had only one option, and that was WWEshop.com. Um, but now, you know, if you want a wrestling shirt, you can go to a billion different places. Um, not to mention, you can go to ProWrestlingTees.com right now and pick up our shirt. Slash another wrestling podcast. Slash another wrestling podcast. See um, what he did there? He was just turning it into one big commercial, folks. Yes, you're welcome. But, um, <laughs> so, you know, there's all these alternatives, and I think that that's what's catching the eye of a lot of your more hardcore, diehard wrestling fans. That's right, and that, it's 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 also sad how these independent T-shirt places are making better products than the actual uh, company. And I don't know, I don't know what's missing. I don't know what's happening or why. But uh, these alternatives coming up, like you sent Lucha Underground, and then locally for us we have FWE Wrestling in New York City. We have Northeast Wrestling up here. Uh, you know, all these alternatives from independent wrestling. Independent wrestling is that B plan that is actually you know turning out a lot better than what you're seeing on TV. And I think the wrestling business is just picking up all over the country right now because there's just so many more alternatives that we're able to get at these shows that we're not getting on TV. And I don't know, hopefully sooner or later people will just shut it off so they realize nobody wants to see a midget bull running around on uh, on TV or a grown man in a bunny outfit who gets his own profile on WWE.com, you know, notoriety, you know, like... People went crazy for uh, Prince Devitt. Oh, I'm sorry, Finn Balor with his uh, body paint on. People wanted that. People want to see that on the main roster. And so it's like time to change. Time to change uh, the way that you're doing things, Vince. Time to you know let whoever is going to run it, Triple H, take over the show. Uh, try to change change these things. I'm not just talking about WWE. I know there's other places that we we talk about, but. You know, it's the it's that history repeating itself to where it's just going back to nonsense gimmicks. Nobody wants to see. The fans are getting older and uh you don't really need to orient ninety percent of your show to like kids anymore. You know, you're you're having a show that's on at night on a mon- on a school night, then kids should be in bed and should be watching it. So you're if you want kids to watch it, have it on Saturday morning cartoons, you know, have it on, have it then and you know, I don't know. Things need to change soon, don't you think? Yeah, and you know our guest today has got somewhat of a plan to do that. As a matter of fact, um, we have none other than Nigel McGinnis on the show today, and he's going to be talking to us about his new project, which is called LA Fights. And you can check it all out on LAFights.com. Um, and I think he's really got something here. It's I don't want to you know say everything because I know that he's going to want to talk to us about it, but. It's something that I've researched, I've looked a lot into, and it's more of an episodic television show. It's something along the lines of Walking Dead or Breaking Bad, and I think he's really got something going with it. We should definitely, you know, I've, I've contributed, I know that a lot of you hopefully will as well, and uh, he's got it on a Kickstarter fund right now, so he's trying to get this funded so he can put an alternative out there. You don't have to say you're going to only watch one wrestling product out there, you've got another option. And, uh, well, let's listen to what he has to say. Today's guest has been called a jack of all trades a wrestler commentator documentarian and now he's working on a new project called la fights uh please welcome our guest nigel mcginnis hello hello hello. how are you uh, awesome thanks for joining us nigel uh did i leave anything out no no i suppose i'd be producer right now wouldn't i that's what my title would be now producer of la fights and if i can get it funded then Probably director. Well, I'm already the writer as well. So, like you said, jack of all trades. All right. Now, I'm really interested in this new project. Uh, I've done a lot of research on it. Um, right. What What is the driving force behind LA Fights? Why Why did you uh, want to get this going? A couple of reasons, really. I mean, number one, I always felt like I I I spent a lot of my life learning the professional wrestling industry, and I felt that you know. People say, write about what you know. Well, that's what I know. Um, 
and, and I felt like um, there was a, a place in the marketplace for something categorically different, a new structure in terms of the business model, but, you know, in terms of the in-ring and the storylines as well. Um, and on top of that, I, I felt like people were clamoring for something different, you know. Um, every Monday night I hear people constantly talking about how they hate WWE or – and, and, you know, this isn't – certainly is not in any way positioned as competition. Mm -hmm. But um, I do hear and have heard for the longest time people going, why can't there be a product which is more like the sort of high-concept scripted shows like Breaking Bad or Walking Dead or shows like that? Um, or people who are fans of, of MMA that go, you know, pro wrestling just doesn't speak to me necessarily on a mainstream level anymore because we kind of see through the cracks now, whereas in the early 90s, not so much. Um so I felt like there was a market for it. People were clamoring for a new product, a new concept. And I felt like I had the experience to turn that product into a reality. And so I spent the last 18 months of my life putting a lot of hard work into making that a reality to where now I've combined all the individual parts of what everybody thinks um, will make the next evolution in pro wrestling. I got together with some producers out here, found out how much it would cost bare bones to make this into a reality, pull in some favors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But not making everybody working for free, making sure that actually this is enough to see it to reality, and that's what I've got. I've got a, got a price tag on it now. I know how much this will cost to get done. And uh, so that's where we are. That's where we are when I launched the project two weeks ago, up to uh, 25,000 now, um, 250 backers. And moving forward, you know, I've got to the end of, month, uh, end of January to get 370, which is a huge spike. There's no doubt about it, but Christmas was December. Now we've got a whole month of, of hopefully some paychecks and people really starting to hear more about it to where they'll get behind it. Absolutely. Now on the, the site, LA, LAFights.com, now I'll probably say it about 50 times throughout this, but just to hammer yeah. it home. Um, now it says that you are setting out to reinvent the entire pro wrestling genre. That's a pretty tall order. Um, but what are some of the things that you see that need to be changed in the, the professional wrestling genre? It's not that they need to be changed. Um, it's that there's a gap in the marketplace for them to be changed. Okay. If you look at WWE, they have a product which is catering to a certain demographic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could argue whether it really caters that demographic or not. But the bottom line is they still you know, make millions of dollars a year. They still sell out arenas all over the world. However, there's a lot of people that no longer are watching that product that I believe would love a different product than more of a high concept product um, with storylines that are more shades of grey, um, characters that you like but sometimes disappoint you and characters that you hate but sometimes surprise you, much like in the real world, you know, and with, with an in-ring style which is more believable and, you know, perhaps arguably in this world of MMA being so prominent in the public's um, sphere, you can suspend your disbelief a little bit more, but... I mean, let me ask you, John, you, you said you, you looked at the website, you've heard a little bit of the pitch and stuff like that. Um, what, what, what in your mind is sort of stopping you from in, investing in the project? Uh, because for me, um, I've heard a lot of people talking about how they don't really see exactly what the product is. Christmas is, is a difficult time as well. Uh, there's a lot of other Kickstarters out there. There have been other Kickstarters that got funded and then never saw the light of day. So what I'm trying to do really is, is sort of understand what the concerns are with people uh, really getting behind it. You know, there's been a lot of people that have backed it and a lot of people that, you know, uh, as I'm saying now, appreciate, you know, everybody sort of trying to push the word and get it out there. But ultimately, I've, I've got to get people putting money behind this to make it into a reality because that's what the sort of. Uh, the, the steep hill ahead of me, um, and I need to figure out what the issue is right now. Yeah, absolutely. I think that right now, like I, I plan um, actually as soon as we get done talking to you, um, I'm going to not only donate, but I'm going to put it out on our site to try to make sure that we, you know, keep spreading the word. I, I really agree with the product. I think it sounds amazing. I know that there are concerns. There's some concerns which you've um, mentioned on the site about it not being funded, but there's really no risk in the sense that if it's not fully funded, then everybody gets their money back. Right. So it's a, it, yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, did the pitch where, where, when you watch it, do you kind of get it? Do you see what it is or do you not? No, I absolutely, I think that, um, and right now with the way that, um, 
I don't want to say independent wrestling as a whole, but the independent wrestling culture, whether it be podcasts like this one or Colt Cabana's um, pro wrestling tees where they don't have to do the same old thing. I think this fits in. Uh, it gives people a choice to still enjoy it, but it also brings raises the level to what you're saying. Shows like Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, uh, Modern Family. So I think that it, it this is what the reality of the situation is, is throughout you know the next five years, ten years that – um, the way that professional wrestling seems to be going, or even MMA for that matter, um, this is what people are going to want to see. So I definitely appreciate what you're trying to do, and I I really hope that this gets funded, um, and and because I'm anxious to see what you have lined up. Thank you, John. I really do appreciate that. Um, you know, it's funny because I've done a couple of other interviews. I did a very um, one maybe two or three days ago or something else like that. And the guy was very um, upfront and honest, which I really appreciated. And, and he's kind of felt like some people um, felt like, well, if this is going to become a reality, why put money in it now when I can maybe put five bucks into iTunes when it goes up on there and see it then? Obviously, my counterpoint was it will never be on iTunes if you don't put yes. money into it now. Um, but I think we perhaps have become spoiled in today's world to, you know, sort of be able to just sit back and wait and i guess to a certain ex extent uh, it, it goes into the whole piracy of, of people's products as well mm -hmm. i know about Cab banner has been um very outspoken about anti-piracy as i have with my documentary as well um to where i know a lot of people still kind of feel as though well i'll just wait until it's up somewhere anyway and then i'll get behind it anyway but that you know in this day and age it really only leaves big companies big production companies to, to put stuff out there and they are doing some great stuff don't get me wrong you know i mean we mentioned the shows which are fantastic um but within the pro wrestling genre you are kind of limited in terms of what new products are being put out there right now absolutely and um just to get kind of back into this just so um people may um if they're if they're foggy on the idea you've mentioned shows such as breaking bad the walking dead modern family um other than these shows that you that you've spoken about, um, what kind of things have you drawn inspiration from for this project? Uh, a lot. I mean, a lot to be honest with you. Um, the the U-ring style, actually, I've been doing jujitsu for the last year and a half, actually, John. Um, Dragon uh, Brian Danielson, Daniel Bryan, mm -hmm. um, when he was wrestling for Ring of Honor, he was doing jujitsu. Uh, for many of the, maybe the last three or four years that he was there, and that influenced his style. And I think if anybody watched him back in those days, he used a triangle, he used a lot of like other submissions that really started to to broaden that 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 gap between pro wrestling and MMA. I don't know what he does nowadays, but um, I think Punk similarly as well. Um, and so for me, I didn't actually start doing that until I retired from pro wrestling because for me. I was always scared of getting injured and then not being able to pro wrestle anymore and therefore not make any money. I think in hindsight, I, I should have really done the same thing that they did because, you know, I think my game would have been infinitely better had I been able to employ some knowledge of a real legitimate um, fighting style, you know. But so since then, I've been doing that for the last 18 months and I'm seeing a lot of sort of similarities in terms of, I mean, I guess to use in tight side of terms when you talk about high spots within pro wrestling, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, headlock, tackle, crossover, and whatever else comes afterwards. Within jujitsu, it's the same thing. You know, you can you can go from um uh, from a guard to, to an arm bar. He pulls the arm out into an uma plata. He rolls out, pins you, kick out, and and it's all there. And it's a whole new avenue of an in ring style. But people really haven't pushed in that direction. Guys like Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish, again, they're starting to go in that direction. And there is, um, it's kind of a gray area because you have to be cautious. And when people say to me, you know, why isn't WWE or TNA doing something like this? It's because they have a fan base that, you know, whether you yourself like it or not, they still like it. They still tune in, they watch that show. And you may very well risk alienating that audience to go, I don't like MMA. I don't want to watch that. I want to see, you know, pro wrestling as it is now. And again, good, you know, good luck to them. Hats off to it. But my theory is that there's a huge audience out there now that is not watching WWE because if you think in the late 90s, there were 10 million people watching Monday Night Wars. 10 million people. Now that number's down to about three or four in a good week, mm -hmm. which means there's six million people who are out there that for whatever reason, maybe they just sort of grew up tired of it or whatever else, they've moved on. 
Um, maybe they're watching MMA. There's a whole new generation of people that have grown up on MMA as well that I think would be entertained and enthralled by a scripted fight entertainment show. And that's really, you know, it is grandiose. There's no doubt about it. You know, and I think some people may roll their eyes when I suggest sort of a complete sort of evolution of the genre. And I get that and I understand it a hundred percent, but I think, um, again, at the, the risk of sounding grandiose and self aggrandizing that perhaps Vince McMahon and, and Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman would have got the same comments at the very relevant times in their career, you know, um, but they had the wherewithal and they had the backing to see it through and uh, history changed because of it. Yeah. Now, um, if, when this project gets funded, um, you stated that you will, you will actually be on the show. Um, could you share with us any other people that who are already kind of involved with the show or people that you would, you would like to get? Yeah. Involved in? Um, J Jimmy Jacobs, uh, I brought him on board as the script consultant because a couple of the storylines I was writing for, I didn't have any personal knowledge. As I said, uh, they say write about what you know, and uh, a, a lot of my theory behind writing storylines for this show was that storylines are already there within pro wrestling. And if you watch a lot of the documentaries that really have got a lot of traction within the mainstream sort of dynamic, the storylines are there from whether it's Jake the Snake Roberts and his issues with drug addiction or uh, Mick Foley uh, with concussions and trying to balance the dangers of the in-ring style versus family um, they're already there. You don't really need to create that. But all you can do is you can write these storylines for people who have already lived it. Now, I've never lived some of those storylines, so I couldn't really write for them, whereas Jimmy has more of an experience mm -hmm. um, with that. So I brought him on from that, and I think he would certainly fit a couple of the roles that he helped write for. Um, there are other guys as well. Um, and again, I won't name any names because at this point, uh, until he gets funded, until we go through the casting process, um, you just don't know who's really going to fit the roles. There are guys that already work closer to this sort of hybrid style I'm thinking about that I would obviously spring to mind. Um, and there are guys who I feel like can really emote. Uh, they can't, like, I, I don't believe that pro wrestlers are great actors. I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible actor. I really am. You know, I've been out here for three years and I've gone for a couple of auditions and every time I just like leave laughing, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like, the reason why I think pro wrestlers uh, are good is because, as as the cliche goes, it, it's it's yourself turned up to eleven. That mm -hmm. was Steve Austin. That was The Rock. That was Mick Foley. Yada yada yada. Same with Brian Danielson. Certainly the same with CM Punk. Um, and so my theory with LA Fights is to write storylines for people that already have those storylines but can emote on camera, that 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 really can get that emotion off because they've lived it themselves. You know. Um, and I think that will really in, endear people to the characters um, because it is real. You know, they're, they're not going out there and pretending to have a drug addiction problem. They've probably dealt with it in the past, and therefore they can get it out there. And I think it will be cathartic. And I think it will speak to a lot of people that are dealing with that sort of stuff now in their life, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, and um, I you recently did an AMA on uh, Reddit, and um, I saw that there were some people that were asking about, you know, whether it be um, – homosexuality or anything like that and you had great um responses to them and it, i think that that's where people will be able to draw the most um relation to these characters are from you know drug addiction or struggling with whether it be religion or whatever and on on wwe right now we're in the you know the pg era as they're calling it and we have right. you know adam rose and a, and a bunny and and those sorts of things so i think that sometimes the bigger com companies kind of take for granted their fan base. There is a huge, and I think independent wrestling really mirrors this, that there's a huge um, group of people that want to be challenged and yeah. want to see these types of situations unfold. And um, once again, that's why I am a, a huge, huge uh, supporter, and I hope that this gets done. Um, I do too, and, and I thank you. And, and really the question now becomes, in the next four weeks until the end of January when the funding thing comes out, how many people who are in that group that really think pro wrestling can be that are going to get behind this project? Because that's that's the reality of what we're facing, you know, um, that we really need to get as many people. And, and I think there are fans of pro wrestling that, that have a bit of money behind them as well. That's my theory, at least. Mm -hmm. Certainly out here in Los Angeles or in any other form of the entertainment business. I think if they hear about this and they really get it, 
they maybe get behind it too as well. And that that's you know that's my goal with this is that I could have sat back on this and I could have tried to go the traditional route, which I did look into to to a certain extent. But no one really wants to touch pro wrestling right now. And again, I could have tried to pitch it as MMA, which you know it could fit within that genre as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, it's, it's all how you see it. But at the end of the day. I wanted to start off and have carte blanche. I wanted to know that if I get this funded through Kickstarter, I can do what I want. You know, I can make this into a reality exactly how I feel like this should go. And if people are backers as well, I mean, everything from the logo people have expressed. I mean, I, I made that logo myself, mm-hmm. and I'm not the best graphic designer, artist, as anybody <laughs> knows, you know what I mean? So once this gets funded, I'm going to reach out to people and say, you know, maybe we'll do a competition about designing. I've already had a couple of people, you know, um, design some things that look fantastic. Uh, there's, a, there's a great guy, um, Harley, who uh, does some video stuff. He's done a, a trailer I just tweeted about as well. So it really is going to be a project that everybody's going to be involved in. Now, obviously, I'm going to have the final say so because it's my project, but I'm certainly going to like reach out for people's opinions. Um, and part of the rewards for twenty dollars or more, you get to see these video blogs. So every how ever so often, I'll film some of the stuff that's going on. You'll see behind the scenes the casting process, the shooting process, the editing process, and, and people arguably don't ever really get to see how things work behind the scenes. And I think so, as well as just the education, or excuse me, as long as just the, the actual finished product, you'll also get an education into what goes into making it, and perhaps then be a little bit more knowledgeable about how difficult it is to make a finished product. Because, and again, as I said, I'm not, not considering this competition, but I do know from my experience with TNA, but to go out for a company like that and produce something categorically different is not easy because you have so many people working in the creative process that you may have a great idea, but by the time it goes to this guy and this guy and this guy and back to you and then back to the TV channel, now it's no longer what it originally was supposed to be. Um, and that's the beauty of this project is it can be exactly what we want it to be. Now, um, it's no secret that you've been an advocate for safer conditions in the world of professional wrestling. Um even though your show would be scripted, as you said, uh, would you feel conflicted if you had to add like blood to heighten the drama in in a certain episode, or do you feel that since it's not really the the real pro wrestling, if you will, um, that you you wouldn't have a problem with that? No, I mean I'm I'm still um, I, I will always be anti blood. I don't realize I don't believe there's any p- place for blood uh, intentional blood loss mm-hmm. within pro wrestling. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think the cat's out of the bag now. Uh, it doesn't fool anybody. Um, now, when it happens by accident, then you know perhaps it can add something to it. Yeah. Um, but my goal within within going through this is obviously I have to sort of stand behind uh, my beliefs, and therefore everybody that comes on board will have to be tested beforehand in case they bleed on the show by accident. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm obviously not going to expect them to pay for that themselves. Um, that's why. You know, this there will be. It is a limited budget. You know, yeah. I need to make sure that everybody is safe. But at the same time, there's not going to be money for flying people in from all over the country or even all over the world. This is a project that people are going to be involved in. I'm not going to ask them to do it for free. But at the same time, they're not going to get rich off it. And I would like to think that they believe in this project as much as I do. You know, they won't be doing it for free. But you know, I mean, let's 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 imagine. Let's say that this does get over as much as we we dream, mm-hmm. and it really does create, if you will, an entire new genre within the, the, the scripted fight entertainment for one of a better phrase imagine if you were on that show imagine if you were one of the first guys to be seen on that show that has literally millions upon millions of people watch it i mean that's that's more value than any amount of money that i can pay you um and that's the reality that's why the money for these six episodes is really bare bones it's not a lot of money in terms of shooting six episodes for a tv show if someone said to me, what's the ideal amount, I'd ask for probably six times as much as this. Yeah. But I know I'm never going to get close to that on Kickstarter. I said to my producer friend who budgets these sort of things all the time, I said, look, give me the bare bones, the absolute minimum I can ask for, or excuse me, the maximum I can ask for to actually guarantee this will see the light of day. And that's what it was. It was 370 including the, the Kickstarter um, cut and taxes and, and obviously paying for all the rewards as well. Now, since this is more of a episodic TV show and not a, a wrestling promotion, so to say, is it difficult to come up with characters that not only have to be loved by pro wrestling fans, but anybody who's uh, turning on this show that may have never been a fan of pro wrestling? Yeah, it's really tough. It's actually, John, um, I, I've written a couple of screenplays in the past, um, and uh, part of the process, and I don't know if you're or anybody's familiar listening, um, is they say that 
a lot of times if you write characters for shows, they come across very um, uh, paper thin. There's not a lot of depth to them because mm -hmm. you kind of, you have an idea for a person, but you don't really know who that person is. You know, maybe you take a couple of character traits from people you know, but it's not a real person you're writing for. So what I've done with every one of the characters, certainly the main characters, is at the beginning of me and Ginny Jacobs together, kind of, I would write three to four pages of, of this person's backstory, stuff that you'll never see in the finished product, yep. um, you know, who they were as a kid, who their friends were, what TV shows they watched, what their favorite color, stuff that you'll never use, but then when you finally start writing and putting words into these people's mouth, now it comes across as more realistic and more genuine because you're actually writing for a fully-fledged human being as opposed to a caricature, you know. So that was a lot of the 18 months that I put into this was doing the background to these characters um, and then trying to put these different characters together and saying, how would they interact? Where would they conflict? And how can I raise the stakes within those conflicts to play out within this genre to where they have to fight each other every week? Now, you, uh, you mentioned that the the what you're trying to raise money for is basically six episodes um if this gets funded when when this gets funded and these six are ex a success would you be open to having like extra seasons or how would that work yeah i mean the whole script actually is designed for a second season and much like life imitating art um the goal is to get as many eyeballs on this as possible um again within whatever limitations there are on how I get it funded. I mean, as I said before, the beauty of Kickstarter is I can do what I want with it, you know, mm -hmm. and if I can put it out there so as many people can see it as possible, I can do that. Now, if I get this money from an independent investor, they're not going to want to give this away for free or even for a limited amount of money. They're going to want to get their return plus as much as possible, which means it can sit on the, on the floor. What I'm trying to do here is I'm not trying to get rich. If I was, I'd ask for more money and I'd try and go a different route. I want to get this product out because I believe in it that much and I know that it can influence the, the, the industry to where there'll be more places for the guys to work. The companies that are in existence, I think, can take little bits from it and, and do it within their own model because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't take a 52-week-a-year um, show and write these sort of storylines for them. It's impossible. You have to have a beginning and a middle and end, much like a TV series for Breaking Bad or anything else, you know? Um, so that's why I'm doing this, and I really believe in it that much, and, and um, that's why I'm not asking for that much money out of it. But in doing so, as I said, writing the script, um, the idea is that it's a small independent fight club in Los Angeles, and they're struggling to exist, and they get a chance to, to be with a major TV channel. And therefore, if they do get with that major TV channel, it'll change everything. I mean, obviously, they'll be guaranteed to be in existence still, but the guys who were on board from the beginning, maybe they won't still have a job, you know, and it's much the same as, you know, guys who are going to be on this first show. If it was to get picked up by you know, like a channel like Netflix or whoever who wants this new product, this new sort of um, content, maybe they wouldn't want that. Maybe they'd want, you know, MMA stars who are already like big names. Who knows? All I know is that I believe this product can, can really reinvigorate the industry and show what is possible. Now, you're um, a seasoned vet on the Kickstarter scene. Uh, LA Fights is coming hot off the heels of your last Kickstarter fund adventure, The Last of McGinnis. Um, how has your life changed since doing that documentary? Um, just, I, I don't know if I can even find the words. I remember I did one of the first interviews I did actually mentioned that, and it really suddenly really occurred to me what a profound effect um, that documentary had on my life and again you know to speak about the, the the value that kickstarter had if it wasn't for the people backing that that kickstarter campaign the documentary never would have happened mm -hmm. and so i was at that stage in my life i'd had my retirement tour um i was a little unsure about my future i mean i spent my life dressing up in spandex pretending to beat <laughs> people up it's not a lot of like you know he can't go to a job i, I tried to get a job in trader joe's last <laughs> You know, which is like a, a grocery store out here and they wouldn't yep. hire me. You know, like, um, you've got to understand that if you spend your whole life trying to be a pro wrestler and it doesn't work out, you're kind of limited in what you can do. And thanks to everybody supporting the documentary that brought me out to Los Angeles, that taught me how to be an editor, that got me my editing job now, and that um, essentially changed my life forever to where now I feel like I'm okay and I'll be all right and I'll, I'll get on all right. And there are very few people... Uh, or, or rather, it has become 
very often the case that people in pro wrestling have difficulty moving on after they've been in pro wrestling, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I will always be grateful for that. I'm now out here in Los Angeles. I love living out here. I've got a job that pays the bills, which, you know, again, in Los Angeles is not the easiest thing to do. And um, really, it did all come back to the whole fact that people believed in me and believed in the project with, with the Kickstarter campaign, the documentary. So um, Lord only knows, as I said, if this gets funded and this becomes a reality, just imagine the sort of effect it could have on my life, you know. And, and I think if, if we watch the documentary, again, that wasn't necessarily about me making money or anything at all. It was really about me coming to terms with the end of my career. And a lot of people have come to me and said that it really sort of influenced them and really spoke to them with issues that they dealt with themselves, dealing with depression, dealing with feeling that they perhaps hadn't achieved what they wanted in their life. And that in and of itself, again, I, I kind of used that in terms of writing LA Fights because I felt like, I want this to not only reinvigorate the industry, but I want it to be a a positive thing that people can watch and go, great, I get it. You know what I mean? Like other people deal with the same sort of things that I deal with. Um, And I think that's the beauty of of, of art is that it can connect human beings in that way. Absolutely. Um, I think the reason I wanted to bring up the whole Kickstarter thing is that you have a proven track record. Um, I know that a lot of people have some concerns about other I, I'm not familiar with the other pro wrestling documentary styles that have been tried to be funded on Kickstarter that haven't come to fruition but um, obviously yours did um, it was a high uh, a very huge success so if that is something that's holding you back or anybody who's listening please don't let that go um, his, his record speaks for itself here so Lightning Lightning round. Round crowning moment of your professional wrestling career um i'd like to say the match with kurt angle mm-hmm. uh, in tna the very first one um and that's certainly not to impute any of the other matches that i had that were amazing and really um you know set me on stage but i think for me that in, in terms of the mainstream genre to go out there and have that sort of quality match with a guy like that to me i'd have to put that there yeah okay now um I don't know if everybody knows this, but you right now edit on the Carbonaro Effect, which is on True TV. It's an amazing show. I highly recommend it. If anybody has not seen it, it's hilarious. Um, with that being said, you also do some some magic on the side. Who, out of all time, who is your favorite magician? Uh, Darren Brown. Although I'm not sure he'd um, like to be called a magician. He's actually, I think, more likes to be referred to as a mentalist. Um, I think when you hear magician, you think, oh, look, you know, out, a rabbit comes out of the hat, and, yes. you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, whereas mentalism, it's a little bit more cerebral. Um, so he, he always blew me away from the first time I saw him. And not only that, again, you know, to speak about the documentary or my, or my um, LA Fights project, I think he, he genuinely is a nice person who wants to try and influence the world for a better, better sort of way, you know. And I think he's very smart and um, very inspiring in that regard certainly someone I look up to. Okay. Now, um, you're working on a television show, so we have to ask, what is your current favorite television show? Man, um, I actually don't watch TV. I watch Netflix. I okay. Mean, and I think, again, uh, I think that's part of my theory is that we get content in different ways now than even five years ago. Um, you know, I know a lot of people don't have cable at all. They, they just watch Hulu or Netflix or whatever else. Um, I'm currently watching, <laughs> it's going to sound depressing, I'm currently watching a documentary about um, letters or diaries that people wrote in the First World War. Wow. So I, had a bit, I, was a bit, I was a big mark for the Second World War. Uh-huh. Um, I, I remember always sort of like knowing that my grandfather and both my grandparents um, were in the Second World War and, and kind of feeling an affiliation with it. But I never really understood that much about the First World War. So I'm le- learning a little bit more about it now and, and how that came into being and everything else. So it's really interesting. Do you, do you know how, how it started, the First World War? No. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, just watching it right now, and it was um, the, the heir to the throne of Austria got assassinated, and they linked it to someone from Serbia. So they were, um, declared war on Serbia, and then Austria called in Germany to be their allies, and then Germany decided to start a war with France so they could go, and it just went from there, and then everybody sort of bundled in. And before you know it, the world was at war, and you know how many millions of people died. It's it's crazy. It's a the domino effect, I guess. I guess so. Um, okay, so uh, what's your? You're currently living in California. So, what is your favorite part of living in California? 
Um, I'd say the weather, really. Um, I mean, here we are in December, and it is cold. It's a little bit cold at the moment, but during the day, the sun's out, and you can walk around in t-shirt and shorts, perfectly comfortable. In, you know, I mean, here I am today. I drove a friend down to San Diego, and uh, there were snow-capped mountains. At the same time, we could have gone the opposite direction, gone to the beach, and gone surfing. That's... Christmas morning, I was going surfing. You know, it's it's like. The lifestyle out here is just fantastic. I don't know why, but everybody doesn't live out here, other than the fact that it's so expensive. Yeah. I get it from that, but I mean, I just, I just love the lifestyle out here. And, you know, everybody is in in the entertainment industry or is doing creative things as well. I just think really that's very inspiring for me. Um, this may have been answered just then, but your favorite non-wrestling related activity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is this a PG-13 show or not? Whatever, whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I am a man after all. Yes. Um, uh, so aside from that, I would say uh, right now, hanging out in coffee shops. Okay. Really. Yeah, I, I really do love just sort of sitting there and people watching and um, being able to write and read and be creative, yeah. All right. And uh, last but not least, um, obviously, uh, if, if anybody knows you, they know that you were – Highly inspired by the Ultimate Warrior. Um, what is your favorite Ultimate Warrior moment? Ah, oh, great question. Good question. Um, there's a few. I'm going to name a few. Okay. I, like. I remember being in, <coughs> in England watching WrestleMania 8. Mm -hmm. And it was the main event, Sid Justice and Hulk Hogan. And I remember sort of like starting to fall asleep. Uh, and it was late at night, but it, it was kind of dull anyway. Uh -huh. as those matches often were at the time. And hearing the Ultimate Warriors music and being so excited and like literally jumping out of bed and like pounding my fist in the air because it was him. I mean, that was probably as excited as I can remember being as a child, just hearing his music. Um, and then... I think his match with Macho Man, where he took like the five elbows off the top uh, and then kicked out. Um, I mean, that was just an amazing time in pro wrestling. I remember the match with him and Hogan, right? I yep. mean, it really was. They, they, those matches were, were, were almost bigger than wrestling, at least they were to me. But perhaps that's because I was a kid at the time, you know what I mean? And I think perhaps for, for those of us that watched then and maybe grew out of it or lost our, our love with it for whatever reason, we forget what it was like to be a kid. And I think there are probably kids now that watch WWE and see the matches on the pay-per-views and have that same sort of feeling, you know yeah. what I mean? So I think it's important not to be cynical and, and understand that um, there's a product for everybody. Lightning round. Well, we um, we definitely are huge fans of yours. We are hoping nothing but the best for you. Um, is I know that I mentioned it, LAFights.com. Um, any other ways that people can get in contact with you or help with this project? Yeah, um, NigelWrestling.com is my website. <clears throat> I'm on Twitter, at McGinnis Nigel, Instagram, at McGinnis Nigel. I'm on Facebook as well. There's like six or seven of me. Uh, I'm the, none, the one that ends in seven. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I should really do something about that. <laughs> um, but really, LA Fights is the way to contact me. You can send me a message on there. Um, I said before in a couple of videos that I've done, I'm being completely open and transparent about this. Um, and I totally understand the concerns that anybody has. Uh, if you're interested in any way, shape or form, and there are things that are stopping you from backing, send me a message. Uh, other people have done that and they've asked questions about what the finished product is. They, you know, sort of, they just, I, I get it. I understand, you know, like this is a difficult time of the year to put money into something. Um, and you want to be rest assured that you're going to see something for your investment. Um, and so any issues you have, literally, I will reply to every single person that writes me. I've written um, 600 individual emails over the last um, three or four weeks, excuse me, two weeks since the project's been launched from everybody that backed the Kickstarter project first of all. I've got 400 more to do, um, and I will continue to do that because this is it for me. Um, you know, I believe in the project that much, and like sometimes people think you just put a project out there and people either listen, take it, or they don't. But it's a job. I mean, you know, every day I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm telling as many people as I can, I'm answering, I'm emailing people um, because it's that important to me. I believe in the project that much. And I think by showing that, hopefully other people will too. So, you know, I appreciate you, John, taking the time to have me on here and 
you obviously you know an intelligent person who, who you know knows his, his fair bit about pro wrestling so it's nice to see you know it really is nice to see that there are people that are educated about the industry so thank you no no problem i think that something that people should think about what as well as um in this day and age i think everybody likes to say oh i like that band before they were cool or i like that team before they were good imagine right. how you can tell your friends that you were backing la fights before it was cool yeah that's that's right. a, a big thing yeah wonderful well we uh thank you for being on the show anytime you want to come back please let us know and um lafights.com and please go out. I'm going to right now as we speak. Um, donate and uh, you guys do as well. Awesome. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate your time, mate. Nigel McGinnis, thanks again for joining us. What a great interview, guys. LA Fights will definitely be something different. Hope you guys go out and fund it. Check out the Kickstarter campaign already. Uh, throw them a few bucks because if you're a wrestling fan like us, if you're a mark like us, then uh, why would you not want to see more uh, wrestling entertainment in your in your week already? Uh, guys, check it out, though. It's going to be a great time. But, Jonathan, we got a lot of stuff coming up. This Saturday, if you guys are listening to us right now, we're going to be at Oakville, Connecticut at the first annual Hammerlock Awards. AWP will be in the house giving away two hammerlocks right uh, if that's what we can call it jonathan uh, yeah. we'll be giving away two hammerlock awards uh the event will be hosted by wwe hall of famer howard finkel uh you guys out there voted for it the fans voted for this on northeastwrestling.com so uh we'll be there this weekend and then uh, what else is happening next week jonathan uh next week i i want to say this to you but don't get it the wrong way i love you uh okay. i love you Oh, I see what you're doing there. That's a little segue to who the guest is going to be next week. Next week, we have none other than legendary Bruce Pritchard. Uh, He's been in almost all the wrestling promotions. He's done a little bit of everything from managing to being backstage to uh, helping run uh, TNA for a while. So uh, he's going to be there, and he's promoting an upcoming debate that he's going to be having in Philadelphia at the Dave & Buster's, and it's on the day of the Royal Rumble, so January 25th, and it'll be Bruce Pritchard, Eric Bischoff, and this just in, moderator Chris Jericho. Wow. Uh, That's... Is there anything... Is The sky's the limit this year, Jonathan. We're going to have anybody and everybody on the show, right? Yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of great guests coming up. I don't want to spoil all the surprises for you, but uh, we've got some, some just amazing guests, so... Stay tuned, listen to us wherever you're at, throw us some good reviews, buy a t-shirt, and uh, just keep on being fans. We want to thank you for listening today. We are an independent podcast. Every week we create something for you to listen to, and it's absolutely free. We are a wrestling podcast for wrestling fans, because after all, we are wrestling fans. If you enjoyed the show today, here are some ways you can help us out. First off, you can subscribe to our show on iTunes. While you're there, rate us and give us a good review. Why not? If you're looking for more AWP, then head on over to anotherwrestlingpodcast.com to find out more about upcoming guests and where we will be. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and buy an official AWP shirt from ProWrestlingTees.com slash Another Wrestling Podcast. We couldn't do this show without you. So tune in next week for <sighs> Another Wrestling Podcast. Another Wrestling Podcast.